so many different approaches to how theater making is happening, how writing, how theater writing is happening, uh, and that. And it was a really exciting conversation. Um, each year we kind of try to embrace both uh, folks that are with us uh, here locally who will come into the festival uh, to put together a conversation. Um, and this year uh, we have an incredible group of people that I'm thrilled that they will introduce folks in just a moment. Um, uh, when we... Um, think about theater making here, we every day sort of have to check ourselves and check in with, if you were going to have that sort of fantasy dinner party, with who you would want to have as part of that conversation, and it wasn't 25 people, it was only five or six people, who would that be? And so really thrilled to welcome this incredible panel of people here today, both writers and directors and theater makers and producers and folks who have done all of it. Um, and I think, you know, for us here at the Playwright Center, we, you know, I, I can speak personally, you know, the, and the experiences I've had in new play development over the last few years in particular, they've really ranged from, you know, some really incredibly positive experiences where um, I feel like the player is at the center of it and their voice was heard and they sort of led the conversation. They were clearly laying out what they wanted and what they needed as part of that development moment and what their goals were for the end. And of course, sometimes you don't know your goals at the end. Sometimes they're general goals and they shift as you go. But I've also been in some experiences uh, in the not too distant past where sometimes either the discussion is so prescriptive and so overcritical that it actually sort of left the playwright out of the conversation. Um, and conversely, I've been in other you know, development situations where sometimes the conversation is so tepid and so watered down that I'm not sure that if there was a goal to make the play better at the end of that process, that we actually really got to that place because there's such a care given. Um, and in some ways, I think, as I've heard a number of playwrights talk about, a lack of trust that I, as a playwright, can actually handle a certain conversation if it's framed right. And so that's a lot of what we want to kind of talk about today, which, which we will dive into momentarily. Um, I'm super thrilled to have Haley as one of my greatest colleagues ever here at the Player Center. Haley Fitness, who's our associate producer, has been with the Center for over six years, uh, on and off, and probably even a little longer than that as a freelance director. Um, and so to have someone who has been both as a director, ambassador, advocate, uh, producer, uh, and uh, you know, sort of emissary for writers in all of that amount of conversations, uh, moderating this discussion today, I'm really thrilled. So if you would just help me welcome and, and uh, thank Haley for our producer. There is a large, beautiful face here joining us today <laughs> among all these beautiful faces. Uh, that is uh, core writer Marcus Gardley. Um, hello, Marcus. How are you doing? I'm good at yourself. Oh, good. It's good to see your incredibly beautiful, large face. <laughs> We're so happy to have Marcus. You know, Marcus has been part of so many conversations that I've watched and learned from over the last few years uh, that we really wanted to make sure we had it here, knowing that he wasn't going to be able to be here for the festival. We wanted to find a way uh, to actually be able to engage with him here. So um, thanks to uh, the McKnight Foundation, we were able to um, purchase and implement some new video conferencing technology uh, along with some projection equipment. What about you? Um, well, I am so happy to hear you uh, say that it was hard to think of an example because I now feel more comfortable saying this name. <laughs> you know, that I, I, I think I can't think of an exact example of a moment where a particular question or something really sparked a response. But in thinking more broadly about what has really taught me something about a play that I'm working on, I feel as though. Um, 
the feeling in the room often tells me a lot. So yeah. you know, that, that something that tells you about the life that's in it that is looking for a way to grow. Um, the more conscious the questions or the more conscious the direction of the feedback, the less useful I've tended mm -hmm. to find it because I feel like I'm onto what I can be consciously and then there's this other thing trying to come to life underneath that. Great. Um, Marcus, what about for you? Yes, I think the best feedback I ever got on a play was when I didn't get any feedback at all, actually. I was taking a course from a playwright uh, mentor of mine and um, I brought in half the play to him and he read the play and then we met to talk about the play and I was hoping he was going to say it was brilliant and he didn't say anything. And so I said, well, what do you think of the play? He said, well, what do you think of the play? <laughs> and I said, well, I think it's great. He says, oh, okay. <laughs> and then he said, well, what, 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 what questions do you have about the play? And so I had a series of questions, things that I was trying to work on. He said, well, go back and try to answer those questions. So I went back and tried to answer the questions. Then I thought, okay, now it's brilliant for sure. And I gave it to him and he read it and I said, um, it's brilliant, right? He says, is it? <laughs> and, and I said, well, yeah, I, this, I was young. And uh, <laughs> he said, the, a, a good playwright knows going into the room for a feedback session what they want to work on. So that when people ask questions that don't have to do anything with what they're at or what they're ready to work on, they can just sh shut that down or ignore it. And that way you're always in control of the destination of the play. And he said, if you want to take this course because you want to know what I think of your work, guess what, I like your work. So we can just get that out of the room. He said, but you need to know what you need to work on so you're always in control of where the story is headed. And it was the greatest advice I think I've ever gotten, the greatest feedback. And in the end, I, you know, he produced the place. So I think he liked it. Um, <laughs> but it was the greatest, greatest experience. Thank you. Lisa? Um, yeah, I, I also had a hard time uh, with this question for some reason, and maybe because my work is devising. I'm a partner with the playwright in the making of the work, so it's uh, my ass is on the line in a very similar way to the playwright's is. I not need um, a, a sense of um, what's honest truth, but also um, telling me where something's alive. To, when I can say to them, boy, that's alive right there. I feel it. It's exciting. Point to what's, what's giving me energy. That, rather than what's not, um, they blossom. You know, they're, they're insecure creatures. We all are. We're all wanting um, to hear the ways that, that our work is, is living. And I think, for me, that's what I found with playwrights. There's very little critique or, or complaint. You know, there's nothing negative in the room. It's all about where it's going that's positive. And because I need that as a maker and an artist, I really feel uh, protective of that process with playwrights. I have one funny story. When I was really young, um, my first company was performing at the, um, and I swear to God, this is a real thing, the Lucille Ball Festival of Comedy in Jamestown, New York. Anyway, <laughs> HBO produces big thing. And uh, I was part of the lineup uh, with Alan Ball's company, Alarm Dog Rep, my company, Sleepless Theater, and Lou Black. We were the late night political scary comedy um, that got done in the basement of the Holiday Inn at 11.30 at night as this thing. Anyway. And uh, we were, my company, we were in our 20s, we were young and, and brilliant, like Marcus's play was brilliant. And we had a, a piece that we were doing that involved gender politics with a cucumber. I mean, I won't go into it, but there was a cucumber involved. It was totally rude. And Lou Black, Lou Black, Lou Black came to us backstage and said, you know, you really do have to cut the cucumber. Um, you can't do the cucumber. And I was like, why not? He goes, because your audience like, it's wrong. You can't do it right now. And I said, you know, I was like, no, we're going to do the cucumber. And it was a complete failure. So I remember to, to sort of listen to my elders. He was smarter than me. He had been down that road longer than I had. And uh, so for me, I, I take who's talking to me into account in a huge, hugely. One of my students, eh, okay, I do care what they think. I think they're really wise. They have a lot to say. But, you know, Jeremy Cohen or, or, or anyone in this room probably has a different way for me. Um, so that's just, just my perception. Positive, positive, positive. Great. What about for you, Marion? Um, got one instance for being a playwright and the other one for when I'm directing. When I'm directing, I think the thing that I say that, that makes the most difference in 
the rehearsal is that I tell the player I want them in the rehearsal room and present. You know, that be part of what we're doing. I don't want them to go home and, you know, watch TV or work on another play. I want them in the room as stuff is happening because questions are going to come up, questions are going to arise. And it's great to have the writer in the room because I go, well, shoot, he wrote it, so let's go to him or her. Mm -hmm. Um, so have, making sure that the playwright is in the room throughout the rehearsal and very active is, I think, the thing that I do best as, as a director with Open New Word. And as a playwright, um, I go along with things. You know, there's maybe six or seven people that I take my work to or ask them to be in the room when I'm working on it and ask them for their straight up dope on it. And they're good enough friends to tell me the truth. Mm. You know, I want the truth. I don't want to be padded and right. told something is brilliant if, if in truth it's, you know, halfway understandable. You know, my son is probably my, my best consigliere. He uh, <laughs> will be very sharp with me. You know, at one point I remember him going, and I asked him, what do you think of the play? And he said, The Lost Boys. And I went, this play reminds you of Peter Pan? I said, I don't know about that. And he said, no, 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 no. He said, so many people get lost when they're in your play. You know, he says, we really want to know what's going on. We really, you know, come in with the express purpose of enjoying it, and you lose us. So you need to look at where you lose people and whether or not that's something you want to do. I said, if you want to do it, then you're fine. <laughs> you know, because I get lost in your play. He says, but if you don't want to do it, you need to go back and look at what your intentions are. You know, and get back to that course that it made you get up in the morning at 4 o'clock and start writing it. So those are kind of the two things that, best me as a director, making sure that the playwright's voice is in the room as stuff is getting decided, as stuff is getting worked on and whatnot, when there's questions from me or from actors. You know, I like the designers to be in the room too. I love to get as many people in the room that I respect as possible. You know, that's why critics don't bother me. Because if I respected their opinion, I'd have them in the room. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and I can't remember really asking one of them to be in the room. Um, and the other one, you know, to be aware of when people get lost in my plays, or when I am getting lost in my play, or when I'm getting lost in language, or or a, a certain sidetrack scene, you know, it's to have people that will point that out to me, you know, in no uncertain terms. Okay. Thank you. What was your son? Oh, my son, he was 15 mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. It's a like national drama right. the best critic, so you yeah. Know, yeah. Well, my son, he grew up in yeah. the rehearsal hall room with me in August, yeah. you know, and he was given August notes when he was eight, so. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you. What about for you, Mickey? I want to start by saying I really don't know. But there are some things that I could tell you. For instance, there is a story that goes like that. Somewhere on a road, an elephant is followed by a mouse. And they walk on a bridge. And the mouse is saying to the elephant, do you hear the noise we are making? The dramaturg is sort of like the mouse. <laughs> <laughs> That's number one. Number two, let me read you something by a poet I admire and I appreciate very much. John Ashbery. I don't know if I'm going to read it all, but anyhow, let me try. And I try your patience. It's called Paradoxes and Oxymorons. And I think he wrote it in 1980. This poem is concerned with language on a very plain level. Look at it, talking to you. You look it out a window or pretend to fidget. You have it, but you don't have it. You miss it. It misses you. You miss each other. The poem is sad because it wants to be yours and cannot do that. 
What's a plain level? It is that other things, bringing a system of them into play. Play? Well, actually, yes. But I consider play to be a deeper outside thing, a dream drawn pattern. As in the division of grace, these long August days without proof, open ended. And before you know, it gets lost in the steam and chatter of typewriters. It has been played once more. I think you exist only to, to tease me into doing it on your level. And then you aren't here or have adopted a different attitude. And the poem has set me softly down beside you. The poem is you. So I think that's all I have to say. Thank I mean, you. I have nothing to say, so I use props. It's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, the next question I had has to do with the audience. So I know um, we always talk about wanting plays to be relevant to an audience. And so we're starting to ask questions about when the audience should be involved in the process. And Marcus is working on a very interesting project right now that I would love him to share with us a little bit about um, this project he's working on with the Lark on his play. Marcus, would you tell us a little bit about this? Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me now? I, we can hear you now. Can you hear me? Okay. There's a program called LPN, which means uh, which stands for Launching Plays, Launching New LNP. Launching New Plays into the Repertoire. And it's uh, a program with the Lark and the Mellon Foundation in which they help produce a play, four productions of a play across the country. So the first playwright, I think, Aloysa American Wonka uh, was the first play, and then I'm the second play in this cycle. And um, so I have this uh, play, The Road Weaves the Rare One's Dry, which is a second installation in the trilogy, and it's gonna have uh, four productions starting in March uh, in Alaska at First Appearance Theater, then it goes to LA at LETC, uh, and then in the lovely uh, city of Minneapolis, uh, Pillsbury House, and then uh, Florida, we do it at University of Southern Florida. And so this is also a, kind of an experiment, and what we wanted to do was we wanted to engage the audience as we made the play, as we, not the writing part, but as we talked about who our collaborators would be, how we were gonna market the play, and um, we wanted to do this so that audiences felt like they were in on the groundbreaking process. They were in on the foundation of why this theater, what kind of work does this theater do, and how can this play speak to their community? And so um, it, there's three major stages. The first stage is I go, we do a reading of the play, and we have the audience give us feedback about the play and about what themes arise out of the play that relate to that particular community. And then the second stage is where I go and do a community workshop. And then the third stage is obviously the production. And so this has been something very unique um, for me. I've never done anything like this before, but I've always been interested in what audiences thought about the play outside of the context of, well, rewrite this or I don't like that. I'm, I'm really not actually interested in that part. I'm more interested in how the play relates to them personally and how it relates to their community. So there's three major themes that we've hit, which is spirituality, migration, and um, history, and our education. And uh, so we have community members talk about those things. We've had responses that have been um, very provocative, one in which the audiences wanted to protest the play because some of the themes in the play. And then we've had um, other instances where uh, one audience member actually brought sage for everyone to, to burn and give a blessing for the play. So it's been a very uh, diverse response to the play. And what it has caused me to do is write, uh, change a little bit of the play for each production. So that certain things that stood out for that community that I'm addressing in the play stand out even more. And it's something that I'm actually very interested in now because of this, this program. And Marcus, I'm just wondering, because I know you had this conversation at Pillsbury House Theater here in Minneapolis, um, just curious to know, if at all anything changed after that conversation that you had with people? Well, you know, I, some of the feedback that I got from um, two artists from the Native American community was that they felt like the play was not a Native American or a um, even a Native American slash African American play. They felt like the play was an African American play. And, um, and I took that to heart. I, I think 
I don't know if place can have a nationality or a race. Um, I think what I'm hoping is that the story is a universal story. That's my goal. And so what I want to do is actually engage audiences who might try to categorize the play and try to push those, um, like Carol Walker talks about, um, these centers that we have, these centers of uh, both um, antagonizing centers or impulses that we have that makes us feel uncomfortable. But if we actually push through to those uncomfortability, those, those impulses that we have, there may be a discovery. So I actually want to talk about those things instead of it being, instead of the play being put in the category, I'm interested in actually engaging um, those uh, dis that discomfort that the play may arise, not to offend people, but to have a, a broader, more di uh, more deeper discussion about these things, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's great. thank you. Um, and I know, Christine, your piece um, that you've been working on dealing with um, veterans mm -hmm. is really different in terms of the project. You're not going from community to community, right. and yet you've been engaging communities. Um, could you talk a little bit about your project? Sure. Um, so um, I'm working on a piece called You Are Dead, You Are Here at the moment, which is um, it's a collaboration with a, a video designer and a director um, that's inspired by the use of video game technology in the training and rehabilitation of soldiers. So, um, so that kind of started out with um, a fascination with the technology and it's, it's just been a really different way of going about making a work because it started from um, you know, a really tiny commission to make a piece that engaged video technology in some way. And for me the question was, well, why does it have to have video? You know, I really I didn't want it to be sort of bells and whistles. Um, and then I found out about the use of these technologies in training and rehabilitation of soldiers. And for me, that was very exciting because it, there's a lot of sort of sharp ethical questions in that for me, the idea of using simulation to recover from real warfare. And, you know, my question is kind of the habeas corpus questions, which is, well, show me the bodies. What happens to the bodies when you're using... So, so that was very interesting to me, and it sort of answered my question of why does it have to have this technology in its making? And then the process of making it put me in a, a situation with my collaborators where I couldn't just do it on my own. You know, we, we had to sort of look at the technology and the way that it was being used. Um, so virtual Iraq is a program modelled on Full Spectrum Warrior, a video game that's now used in the rehabilitation of veterans that come back from Iraq with PTSD. Um, it's used in therapy, it's like a video game where the veteran puts on these immersive goggles and is sent back into animated landscapes of Iraq that are then rebuilt in conversation with the therapist based on their memories. So, so there was sort of a collision point with a lot of communities that I know nothing about to build this piece. Um, and it took us to military hospitals, it took us into conversations with veterans. Um, and, and so we've been building this thing from the inside out. Um, uh, one of the things about that process in terms of its relationship eventually to audiences and programming is that it was a really exciting way to start working, which was to be with two other artists and going, we're going to do this damn thing. You know, whether or not any theatre comes along and picks it up, we're not going to start in that passive place of, oh, submit my work, be interested in me. We're going to start from, we really want to do this, how are we going to do it? And we started from that, that nucleus, and then we started moving outwards to find the people that we needed and find the resources that we needed and to understand how this technology worked. And in the process, we found that we were starting to have conversations that were very live, you know. So coming back to this first question about feedback too, when we did early readings of this piece, we had some veterans come and sit and watch this piece. And it's not soldier hagiography, you know. There's a story about this African-American veteran who comes back with PTSD from the war in a conversation with a white therapist for this programming. But the other character in my play is a girl blogging from Fallujah. So the idea is that their interface is through this virtual technology that was actually engaged in the war. So it's not a piece that only looks at what happens to veterans. It's also saying there's this massive civilian damage in Iraq, and that's very important to me. So it was nerve-wracking to show this to veterans, you know. Um, but the thing that told me that there was life there and that really made me want to keep going was that they all wanted to stay and tell us stories afterwards. 
So it wasn't about what are you doing in your piece, it was about, no, actually this happened here and you know, you really did have to decide whether to shoot a 10 year old boy on the street when you saw him pick up a cell phone. You know, mm -hmm. so things like this, people were just dying to talk to us about these things and I think that you have a feeling in the room of respect when you're going for the truth. Even if you fail at going for the truth, I feel like the danger of trying to do something that is true and not in the documentary representing other people's experience sense of true, but in the sense of following that, that hard line towards something that you want to find. That brings, that brings the kind of collision and the intensity that Marcus is talking about with those audiences into the conversation. So it's been a huge education for me in terms of, of trusting that. Um, and, and Christine, and, yeah. just, just to ask you a question, um, who is moderating those conversations and how are they facilitated? Oh, um, well so um, we've been uh, guests at a few different places. Uh, the director Joseph Meagle is based at UNC Chapel Hill. So our very first outing was for a, a festival called Collaborations in Arts and Humanities. Um, and we invited friends and people that were around in the military and in video game communities to come into our early readings. And since then we've also been at the ART uh, with their graduate program and then at Georgetown. And we're now resident artists at Here Arts in New York. Um, but we're, we're just doing a lot of outreach through military connections on our own as well. KJ Sanchez has been helping us to meet people. Um, we uh, worked with students at Georgetown who had cousins and brothers who were in the military and they took us out to Walter Reed. Um, the guy who designed Virtual Iraq has become a friend and a collaborator and he's given us the software to use and he's introduced us to therapists and people at Walter Reed. So, so through a kind of growing network and through help from universities and here, we've been able to reach people and then kind of move out that way. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's terrific, and it's certainly a, for a specific play and a specific project. Yes. But I'm also wondering, um, maybe this Jim's question for you, um, what it would be like in New York City, which is a very different kind of community and <laughs> perhaps um, you know a, a different type of play, the, the plays that you produce that don't always um, that aren't really as community specific. I'm just wondering if what your process is uh, in inviting the audience in. At, if at all, through this process, or what audience you, the role of the audience for for you, Jim. You're speaking. To oh me? yes, Jim. Yeah, I was just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were speaking to Christine. Yeah, you know, I was just saying for you, I'm the Jim. I was just saying the other <laughs> for the um what your um <clears throat> for the project that you're doing in your theater workshop is so different from that sort of work that Christine is you know as an artist sort of going out there kind of producing her own work, whereas with plays to come to you, you do help develop them, but you also produce the play. Yeah. Um, just wanting um, your perspective as a producer, where do you feel the audience's place is in the development process? Well, this is something we're thinking a lot about right now, because um, the, the, um, in talking to, you have a sort of loyal, uh, die-hard group of followers, and the more that they can get their hands on a process, mm -hmm. um, the more they like it. Mm -hmm. And the, the more they, uh, just sitting in the theater, seeing the play, and experiencing the, the vision of the artist that way uh, isn't, isn't enough for them. Um, so we're really in the middle of trying to figure this out. What, what, what do you, how do you give them, I think it's a good thing that they're interested in the process of, of an artist. Because I believe that um, a major purpose for a theater company to live in a community is not just to give them the product, but to remind uh, the, uh, the community that the product is really, actually, the process of uh, imagination at work. Mm -hmm. um, and how do we connect, uh, and that, um, was always moving to me about the original conceiving of the regional theater was that, uh, and I was around for that and remember the excitement I felt when Hartford Stage was announced on the front page of the Hartford Current as coming into existence. That, and their angle was, there will be artists living with us, making work amongst us, for us. 
And I think one of the problems, I think, in the regional theater is that they haven't actually pursued that particular angle as intensely as they might have. Mm -hmm. The actual engagement with the creative process, the life of an artist, mm -hmm. the life of a poet or a pri I mean, their artists, I think, are the, the shamans, the priests mm -hmm. of our, of our um, secular lives. And we haven't, we haven't succeeded. So that's the angle I'm trying to pursue is how do we make, how do we, how do we get that to happen without disrupting the creative process, mm -hmm. you know, without, without um, twisting it or, or distending it. And I'm starting to have some conversations with some individual artists about what they think about this, but nothing is conclusive right now. But I think it's a really, this is a major thing about how the theater is going to survive and go forward into the 21st century, is getting to this point. What is the experience of, the, of art beyond just being in the presence of the finished play mm -hmm. or the finished thing? Right. How do we get the artist and how they live and think and breathe without uh, compromising it or, t or you know, twisting it in some way, influencing it to, uh, how, do, how do we bring that together? And do you think that um, from some of the ideas that you're coming up with, is that to have them involved during the process of creation or is it about sharing the process with them after the play is already up I don't know. Feet? I don't know what it is that they're hungry for yet. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, I think the next, when, when we stop, when we, we're a little further down the conversation with artists, I think it's then conversation with, well, what exactly is it you're looking for as an audience member? Mm -hmm. Or as a, um, you know, a, someone who appreciates the artist. What is it more you want? To, what more do you want to know? And I know it's not to talk back after the show. It's not, mm -hmm. um, you know, fireside. We do these fireside chats, which are somewhere early in the process of in, in rehearsal, uh, in the rehearsal room, and that seems to be really critical. What is the fireside chat? Uh, someone talks to people involved in the process of mm -hmm. making this play at hand, and um, you know, we'll chat about what's going on. Mm -hmm. Nothing, you know, that we aren't all very familiar with. Right. But there's something about being in the room, the mm -hmm. rehearsal room, that's very exciting and uh, intoxicating to the audience members. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's I'm, I'm talking at the moment. We're still at the very beginning of this consideration. So mm -hmm. maybe later we can check in on that. Yeah, I would love to follow up on that. Um, yes. Can I just say something really quick? I just I love what Christine said earlier about that when she shared the process with veterans, they had their stories to tell mm -hmm. and they were dying to tell them. I think it's not just about what do the current theater audiences want more of, but also how do we get other people that might not think of the theater as a yep. place now that the theater and art can be at the center of cultural dialogue and healing and stopping the polarization and all the crap that's going on, not the entertainment way. Mm -hmm. but the center of it, right? Mm -hmm. Serious art going on, uh, that doesn't mean one kind of art, it just means it's valid enough <coughs> of a form that it should be at the middle of our society, involving, involving people in the creation of it and in the watching of it, and not again, like, like Jim's saying, here's some plays for you to come and see when you're taking a break from real life, mm -hmm. which is fine too, there's right. nothing wrong with that. But I agree that the regional theater, unfortunately, you know, it, in some ways it's moved in that direction rather than the other. And I think there's a hunger right now in the country for this and mm -hmm. this kind of experience and what you're experiencing with your audiences. I certainly feel it with mine. We have a lot of contact with Russian immigrants here because uh, our work is bilingual and works across cultures a lot. Um, and uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're dying to, 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 to be a part of it, you know. They are not artists themselves, but they understand that art isn't just a frill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They want it at the, and for Russians, they really understand that because they live through it in Russia where, you know, the theaters are packed mm -hmm. and it's because it's the one place you can see the truth. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, I, I love what you're saying that you're working and I just love this, I, I just wanted to go back to what Christine said that they, hearing their, the artist talk made them have their yeah. stories come up. That is such a beautiful, beautiful uh, rave review mm -hmm. of a process. Great, thank you. Um, so these are um, moments where it seems like the audience is deeply invested in the process. Um, you know, I think a lot of theaters are also have.
talkbacks, which happen either during the development <laughs> process, which I know many of you have experienced, um, or um, afterwards when the piece is up on its feet. Um, and you know, we as a field, I think, are recognizing that a lot of this is for audience development um, and, and perhaps less important to the playwright, um, him or herself. But I'm just wondering what this panel thinks about the notion of talkbacks, either during the development process or um, post post show conversations. And is there any value? And if there is value, what form should they take? Does anyone want to speak on this? Well, I, I don't think I've ever met an artist who isn't anxious to yeah. engage with the audience outside of the work. Mm -hmm. I think I have met many who are. Um, <clears throat> not necessarily willing to hear um, the audience's opinion on how to fix the play mm -hmm. yeah. or the production, <laughs> and so I think they try to. We try well to, moderated. Right? Yeah. Well, there's. I don't know what that. You know, that's the area to mm -hmm. find. And uh, I feel, in general, this again. I feel at our theater, you know, other theaters I've been to, the, this area of how to expand or enlarge the experience for the audience beyond play in and of itself. It's so hard to you know, pull that off mm -hmm. in and of itself. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to give them more because they're hungry for it. We're not, we're, not, uh, we're not providing that in an interesting way. Mm -hmm. Where I'm speaking for us. Mm -hmm. uh, we do a very routine kind of, this is the design idea. We, mm -hmm. You know, in conversation with the designers, a little bit with the director and the playwright. Um, and you know, people stay for 15, 20, 30 minutes and then they want to get home. Mm -hmm. And it's not, I don't, it doesn't feel to me um, like in any engagement. way satisfying what those people who did stay are looking for. Uh -huh. And do the playwrights, are they involved in that um, process? Yeah. They are. I mean, we leave it up to them. Right. But most of them, uh, uh, um, we don't do, we try to avoid, uh, in previews, we really try to, we do much more. Um, aggressive uh, structuring of the conversation mm -hmm. and, and moderating the conversation and, and leaving questions to a minimum mm -hmm. question time. And after we're open and things are finished, uh, you know, and we're, we're breathing a little easier, um, all of us involved, uh, we can be a little bit more relaxed. But um, And I, I, again, I, don't, I, I think that's what we've come up with as a way to try and stop the how to fix the play things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you know, for determined audience members, even that doesn't do it. <laughs> um, but it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel. It feels like a band aid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I wonder. Uh, you know, I mean, I, as a playwright, I fundamentally loathe talkbacks. You know, um, and it's not because I don't want to talk to an audience. Yeah. You know, I really do. Um, but I wonder sometimes about. Um, whether, whether some of the involvement in the conversation could be more about curating on the front end, you know, rather than, mm -hmm. bam, you've just had an experience, tell us what you mm -hmm. think of it on the back end, you know. And yep. I'm thinking about um, myself as an audience member, that what I really love in the theatre is being in the dream of the play, you know, and if all yeah. of the aesthetic elements of the thing have really been working, I'm transported into something that I couldn't put into a rational thesis right after it, you know. I mean, and the less that that's true, the more I could probably do a summation of the narrative and a, and a point kind of thing. Um, so, so there's something about the aesthetic experience that, for me, doesn't flip quickly into um, a, a critical conversation afterwards. But I'm, I'm also wondering about whether there's a sort of front-end way of of inviting people into the dreaming of the play, you know. Um, I did a workshop with Cutting Bowl Theatre in San Francisco one time. They do a festival called Risk Is This, where they invite artists to do a week's workshop and to do some design elements. And, uh, you know, as with here, they say the, the playwright is the artistic director of the experience. So I said, I do not want to do talkbacks, but I want to figure out another way of engaging with an audience. And so what we decided to do was to really do a design presentation and a conversation before the piece where we spoke before the reading about what we were going for and what our experiments mm -hmm. were and here were some of the things we were looking at and some of the things that we were talking about in the room. Um, and then we said if anyone wants to have a glass of wine with us in the foyer afterwards and have a chat, we'd love that. 
So we did that instead of a talk back, but, but the director and I and the designer talked and showed some things before the reading and you know we said and we're still really unsure and nervous about X and Y and here's some things we're going for and so, so we sort of had a conversation beforehand and then a, um, a chat and a glass of wine afterwards and it's not like that was perfect but it made me think that maybe there is a way of curating and bringing people into a conversation um, saying here's what we're going for and bam now here it is, you know, so that there's those two things can be in dialogue. Um, and then my last thought on, on that is that I think this question of how you engage the audience is tied to an idea which I think is really problematic, and that idea is that new plays are a genre. You know, they're not all, all new work is, is different in some way, but somehow the marketing of it, just because a living writer is writing something at the moment as a new play, puts it in a certain kind of category. And in fact, I think plays are always in dialogue with the past and with other aesthetics and other artists. And perhaps there's a way of building seasons that have one play, a current play by a living writer, that's in dialogue with a particular play by mm -hmm. Shakespeare. Or, you know, maybe Marcus has his three artists that are really inspirational to him in one historical event. And maybe there's a, a longer curating track that puts the work in the context of who the artist is in dialogue rather than the concept of product and new work that might be an interesting way of bringing the audience in. Great, thank you. Um, I'd love to pose this question to Marion and to Marcus, and I know you guys have worked together as playwright director before, um, recently actually in a workshop. Um, just what is that relationship between the director and the playwright, and, and, and do you give ever give feedback to the writer? What are you looking for in that collaboration? I'd love to hear any thoughts. Um, well, you know, I think, uh, like in the case of work with Marion, it's, it's very much a marriage. I feel like it's a, a, good, a strong bond that you have and what's great about Marion, because he's a playwright as well, he is very protective of the writer in the room. And um, and so I never for a moment feel like he, when he makes choices, um, I never feel like he has to go through me because he'll make a choice, you know, off his instinct and, and then he'll come in and check it with me about it. And it's a really, I love that. So he's free to create um, are to discover, and then in the process, I know that he's always going to check and say, well, "What do you think about that, that choice?" And uh, and 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 it's always just it's so much fun because a lot of times directors either they're too intimidated by having a playwright in the room, or they feel like um, they just can't they can't uh, make any choices um, with uh, without you know being judged, and so it's great to have somebody who's also you know, works like a jazz musician. And he just goes in there and works, and then he checks in with you every so often. He says, is this the right music that you want in your piece? And it's exciting, it's very, very exciting. And I also want to respond to this talkback question, and then of course I'm gonna to have to leave. But I think talkbacks, in, in, in after reading, post-play post reading uh, talkbacks, I think they're dang they can be dangerous. Um, I really love talkbacks after production because then the audience can see the full dimension of the play. Plays are meant to be performed, not read. And I, I love that, and I especially love when I had a really good opportunity of watching a friend of mine's play, and the audience was really confused after the first act. And I was sitting near some um, uh, incredible people in their golden years, and we were talking, they had a lot of questions about the play because it was about the internet. And I had a really, really powerful discussion with them. They taught me some things. I felt like I taught them a few things about the play. And then after the play, because we, we had our own talk back. Mm -hmm. We went and had coffee to talk about questions about the play. Mm -hmm. So, so much about uh, I think the theater is we're trying to answer issues. Mm -hmm. And what would it be like if we looked if we we, we look for the questions? What are the questions that the play is arising and trying to figure out the answers amongst ourselves? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times the playwright is not trying to answer a question; they're raising the question. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really interesting way of looking at art. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point, and it kind of goes back to what you were saying, Jim, about really the art of the question, mm -hmm. and that's maybe exactly. something that we need to think about, um, you know, is really that art, and spending some more time around how we ask questions or what the questions are, and maybe the answers are less important than the questions. Um, that's great. Uh, well, thank you, Marcus. We'll let you go, because I know you have to go off and direct a play. <laughs> um, Marion, is there... Thank you so much for having me. Oh, bye, it's bye, bye, Marcus. Great to see you. See you soon, brother. Bye. Bye. Have a good show.
Mary, I just want you to get a, a chance to um, answer this question um, about the director's relationship. And I know, especially with August Wilson, you, you were involved in a lot of the development of those plays as well, and just what that process is of working with a playwright, either with August Wilson or Marcus Gardley, any, um, w when you're actually giving uh, feedback to the, the playwright about what you're seeing. Well, it's really important to know um, how to give the feedback to the writer so that it's beneficial to them in the working on the play. Um, I find as a director, especially of new work, that I really have to keep my ego out of the room. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's, it's about so many things that I have to do. And for me, the, the most important relationship that I have to cultivate in that room is between the actors and the playwright. You know, they're the musicians that are going to be performing the song. Mm -hmm. You know, so they should get to know the songwriter mm -hmm. some and why the song was written mm -hmm. so that they can do their work of delving deeper into the piece. It does no good for them to delve into the piece if they don't know what the piece is about or they don't know what's intended mm -hmm. by the piece. So I, I feel like I should have to keep my ego out, out of the room, excuse me, so that I can help find those questions that will drive the play. Um, also, I'm going to take on a little bit with Marcus as far as talking about talkbacks. Uh, back in the day, here they used to have Monday night readings where there were talkbacks afterwards. And in the beginning of that, it was very beneficial because the audience knew they weren't seeing a complete play, competed play. So they had questions about the play. And those questions could help the writer go back and look at his play. But it wound, what it wound up becoming after a while was like a professional talk back. That there were people there that came to all the, sh to all the readings and the, re the talk back was more about them yeah. than it was about the play. You know, you know, in that case, it's a playwright sometimes when somebody says, well, what I'd like to see in this play, <laughs> nah, 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 nah. and you go, oh, that sounds interesting, why don't you write it? <laughs> but that's not what I'm doing. Right. Yeah. You know, that's not what I'm intending here, so that sounds good, write the play. But, you know, can we please get back to this one? Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, I think that you have better talkbacks when the play is done. One, I like going to those talkbacks because the questions seem to be better mm -hmm. and not so much about how I would do the play. And do you think they're better because of the framework of the fact that this play is done? Or do you think that they're better because the questions are actually uh, framed better in that context? I think, I think because the play is done that their questions can become framed better. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people, after a while, at the talkbacks, didn't look at the plays as far as being in process. Mm -hmm. They looked at the plays as far as them being done. And said, well, I didn't get this, and I didn't get this, That's and I didn't get this. And then I said, well, yeah, yeah, I understand that, but what about the questions the play raises? Because mm -hmm. you know, those are the things and the answers to those questions can be helpful in guiding the work. You know, it's all about what helps the work. It's all about what helps you when you get back into the room. You know, and I try to keep as many people flowing in and out of the room so that we you are getting fresh takes on it. Mm -hmm. You know, I try to encourage the artistic director to come in periodically so I can get their senses as we're creating. Where it's more helpful than sometimes sitting, what I call the firing squad, after the first run through. Mm -hmm. <laughs> take your blindfold and have your last thing. You know, <laughs> take the bullets. So you're having those people who are invested in the process really be part of the process rather yeah, than yeah, yeah. I mean, for they have a love for the work, or else mm -hmm. they wouldn't be doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, they have a connection to it, or else they wouldn't be doing it. So let's get what that connection is, so they can be part of what we're working on. You know, it's always better for me to, to get those comments in the time of working on the play. Because mm -hmm. that's to me the best time to work on it. And, uh, it's better than after the first run through and when I, stuff is starting to solidify inside mm -hmm. of there. Then sometimes it feels interrupted. Mm -hmm. You know, but if I get them in earlier, you know, I say, come on in. And most artists are just like to come on in mm -hmm. from time to time. So it's. It's getting people, you know, coming in, getting their feedback as we're working. And so it's stuff I can 
converse with the playwright. But the most important thing in the room for me is for the playwright and the actors to get a bond, mm -hmm. for the actors to know what the intentions are in this play and for them to go after that full force. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, so now is the opportunity to open it up to you guys. Um, and um, if you have any questions for these brilliant artists, artistic directors, dramaturgs, I'd love to see any questions. Yes? Um, I have a question for, oh, uh, I have a question for the Jewish the playwrights in the room. Um, have you ever intentionally or unintentionally written yourself into a character? And then if you see and get criticism on that character, how do you mm -hmm. process that? <laughs> well, that's like the first problem that I usually run into as a writer, is that after a while everybody talks like me and has my ideas and has my ethics. And that can be fun for me to watch, but I think it gets rather boring to the audience if there's no movement on the questions. So I feel that I have to go back and really start to learn who these, play, who these characters are get them to talk to me. You know, I used to think when, when writers said, oh, my, my characters talk to me, I went, yeah, yeah, okay. You know, but in truth, you have to get them to do that so that you can write them and not you. I think there's always gonna be a little bit of the writer in, in, in the characters, just because it's part of why we write, is to get our ideas out there or to ask questions that we really feel need to be asked. Um, but um, it becomes a strict process for me to go back in there and make sure I'm having the character ask that question and not the character just be a vessel for me to say all the stuff I believe in. You know, to really get to learn the story that I intended and really get to learn who the people are in it. I think it's one of the hardest things, but most important thing I have to do as a writer. Mm -hmm. What about for you, Christine? Do you ever come across that problem of putting yourself in the play and then feeling that that character is speaking your words rather than the character's words? Hmm. Um, I don't feel that people like me as a person are ever in my place because it's not my impulse. But I think for me, the way that I connect to your question is this idea of am I over controlling my play and making my characters be puppets for my opinions, you know? and um, the playwright Eric N said something that really stuck in my mind as great advice, which is follow your writing, don't make your writing follow you, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I think there is this thing about finding the specific and, and having, letting, letting go of the desire to make the play a sort of a shiny reflection of what would make me look clever, you know, but to, to let the voices start to have their own autonomy and take me somewhere, you know, and I mean, I, th I think about this question of voice and what is a playwright's voice and kind of where I'm up to at the moment with that is I, I think that voice is to do with your sense of pattern in the world, you know, that our, that our minds are pattern making machines mm. and that's how I experience poetry and to me a playwright's voice is about rhythm and pattern and, and, and following, following the way that that echoes in the world. You know, and but for me, learning to follow rather than impose is is the trick. So I don't know if that's quite your question, but that's that's how I struggle with my domination over the play rather than listening to the work and trying to be a vessel for it. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions? Yes. Oh, the microphone. That way we can all hear you. Right. <laughs> For the playwrights in the room, I'm curious, how do you uh, empower yourself to have the dialogue that you need, to frame the discussion and the feedback? What do you do to enable that, knowing that you work in different places and, and different institutions all the time? What are some of the tools that you have to get what you need? So, May I answer here, not answer, attempt a comment? Oh, sure, please. I think that if the playwright doesn't have one's own power, no one can empower the playwright. The playwright is a centerpiece. Yes. So all of us are like, I don't know, there's a scaffolding around the building. 
and we go around and talk about the building that's not ready, but we took it as scaffolding and talk about how insufficient something is in the building. Right. So, but um, for the playwrights who are often put in situations where they are in these sort of, I think what Megan you're saying, you, that, that you are asked to be in talkback situations or you are asked to be in feedback sessions, are, are there ways that you can frame the question to sort of empower yourself to um, get what you need out of the experience? I'm sorry I have not finished. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> sorry, I didn't know. Unfortunately, most of those who go through the channels to see that place that form produce have to go through this process in which experts like me, let's say, <laughs> tell you how the place should be. And I resent that. I think you should know how the place should be. Unfortunately, it's, it's an estuary, it's not a delta. And everybody tries to get to the best options in order to see the play done. Uh, it's nothing new, I, what I'm saying. Uh, long ago, I was thinking that the Guthrie should have a relationship with the Playwright Center. How many works that the Playwright Center has developed, helped develop, ended up on the Guthrie stage? You can count them? Yeah. Any? <laughs> and then they come and say, it's a big Guthrie. It's a BBG, as I call it. It's a big blue Guthrie. Um, kind of going back to the, I think that's, that's an interesting point in terms of what you're saying. Oh, yes. Yes, I just want to follow up just so that one of the playwrights, well, actually, you are a playwright, so maybe yes. you would like to answer this question, Carla. Yes. <laughs> what question? The question uh, that Megan was putting forward um, about just how you can create your own framework for those conversations so that you can get what you want out of the experience. But I, think I, I go back to what Michael said. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really not a way to resolve a problem because of generic. Playwright, what I mean, it's as individual as a person how one traverses these kinds of situations. The question is, how do we alter the power relationship? And probably we can't do that. Probably we have to change the culture, period. I mean, it's just like what Marion said. This is this sort of insane expectation that people who are working 48 hours a week can come in the theater and have a playwright who does 24-7 how they should fix their plans. That's just dishonest. That is giving them more responsibility than they really need to have. How do we solve problems? I mean, well, you know, what Marcus said about the playwright asking the question. What is the question? I think when we come into these rooms, we don't even really know how to ask these questions. We say things like, how does someone who is not empowered becomes empowered? That doesn't happen with nice conversations. You only get power by taking it. Right? So, you know, it's, it's, it's not a nice, it's not a, a really resolvable situation unless we find a way to ask the critical questions without accepting the circumstances which oppress us. But I feel like you, you do by um, putting collaborators in the room that you really respect, you know, and that you are able to create that conversation with those writers that you've had long-term relationships with. We try to step out of the system and try to eliminate anything that doesn't have anything to do with making the art. When we go to a theater and have to do these things and develop these things, and we, we ask and we never get the answer, have you considered whether this is audience development or play development? Right? And then when you ask that question, then people look at you like, Thing, looking at a wristwatch, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Go on to the next thing. You know what I mean? I mean, no one answers the question, you know? And it creates a, an atmosphere when we come to the institution where there is no curiosity, no discussion. You are, are continually assumed as it's a system. You know, it sort of works easy, and there is no room for individuality of human beings in the system. When we work together, that doesn't happen. And that makes the art efficient and, and makes the best use of our resources. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, other questions? Uh, yes. Looks like we have a question that's being tweeted. 
Uh, yes, we have a question from Twitter. What does the panel think of the impact of social media and live <laughs> online workshops on the development of new work? Is it less personal? That's very apropos. <laughs> uh, who would like to respond to I'll that? I'll a quick thing. Yeah, uh, sure. I recently made a couple of pieces that um, involved designers from the very beginning and actors from the very beginning and playwrights from the very beginning um, and even scholars from the very beginning. So they were all in the room together, but um, several of my extremely talented designers live in other states and I didn't want, I don't have the funds, my company that is not the big blue guys in the city. You can't bring people in for every meeting and all that. So we set up a lot of um, innovative ways of staying in communication and literally being in the room together that I, I was completely suspicious of because I'm not of the generation uh, that gets that intuitively. Um, but it was fantastic. And I got to have a real respect for, for how that can bring people together. I mean, we had Marcus here a moment ago, which I thought was exceptional. So I was able to have my designers kind of in the room with me um, to, remarkable, to remarkable levels of um, proficiency, even, even that. I was a part of, when I was at Yale, there was a, one of the early hookups to Russia. We had combined rehearsals on this minor project. This was in like 1998, I guess. And it was this really big deal because they had cameras set up and the Russians had to get up early in the morning and they were miserable, but they were always miserable. So, you know. But we had this whole like conversation with them. It was really disjointed and awkward. We tried to have a rehearsal. And everyone was like, well, that was an epic fail because we couldn't do it in real time. It was a long delay. And the Russians were just completely bewildered by it. But, you know, I'm happy to say that now, whatever it is, 14 years later, I, I think it's a tool that is extremely exciting. So I'm just going to speak for it. And my students, you know, I teach at the U, and they're all over it. And they're building stuff. They're literally building whole performances online. And then, uh, or building correspondences online, performing them live, bringing people in so the rehearsing has been done, uh, not in the room together. I, it's very, it seems really strange to me, but... I have to say, I've seen it now work in extraordinary ways, so I don't know what Twitter is at all, though, so I'll say that. I don't know what a tweet or a tweet is. Great. I don't know what a Twitter is. That's good. That's good. Um, great. Um, other questions? Uh, yes, over here. Uh, I, I, this is actually a question for the, um, I guess it's a question for everybody, for playwrights as well, but, but for the dramaturgs and artistic directors in the room and people who, and or friends of playwrights who, who sit in and, and foster or, or facilitate some of this question answering, is there one or two or a whole series of um, core questions that you find you start with? Uh, what what is there a first question that that is always you know the first one or is it totally and I mean I'm sure it, I know it changes from play to play and I know it changes from playwright to playwright and and moment to moment depending on probably what mood you're in and what day it is but but is there um, a really useful first question or first set of questions that that you start a discussion with with your playwright. Um, I think I'm more along the lines of what you were saying, that it's different from playwright to playwright uh, and place to place. Um, I start with my relationship to the playwright, what they've told me about the play, uh, questions that, they've asked, that I've asked that they answered with another question. Um, but I guess basically um, I try to find that first thing from what the playwright is saying and who that playwright is. Um, playwrights are wonderful uh, creatures. Uh, I said being a playwright myself. Um, to face, <laughs> you know, to face that that empty page and put something on there uh, takes a lot. You know, because you're going to be putting your ideas and your beliefs 
out into the general public, and most of us don't have to do that. Well, so, and, and one of the reasons that I ask is because I do have such great admiration for the playwright, and I often look at myself and go, who the hell am I to, to have anything to say about this amazing but, thing? That but you don't you think playwrights so really also want partnership? I feel yeah. like it's about, so much of the conversation today is about how do we uh, avoid isolation and how do we build community either with audience or with between playwright and director, between actor and playwright. So much for me is about, I, my, one of my first things I always say, I think, is what can I do for you? You mm -hmm. want some tea? You want a cookie? What do you need? Chicken soup? Whatever it is that they need, I want to give it. And at the same time, I want to say, what do you want to give me? So it's right away a relationship of two adults. It's not, it's not a, a grown-up talking to a child. This right. happens with, all the time with the director who's supposed to know everything, which is completely ridiculous. <laughs> We're there to ask questions, literally. We're there to know the least in the room. Liz Diamond is so great about that. Just be stupid. We're the stupidest one in the room. We have to be to help everybody figure out what the questions are. Actors, too. We don't need to talk to actors like they're children. They're not. We're all here. So for me, it's right away. What do you, what do you want out of? What can we? What do we together want to make out of this? And I also ask a question: What's the motor at the center of this piece? Mm -hmm. What's our motor? What's our? What's the vibrating part at the center? What's the rhythm of it? What's the atmosphere of it? What do you think the texture is? So that we can start to vibrate out from the center of the core of why mm -hmm. this thing is even going to exist. And I don't call it a play always, but sometimes it's not a play. Sometimes it's something else. And I think Marion's right. Every single playwright is so unique. I mean, we see it at Play Lab, right? That amazing smorgasbord the other night. It's like a dream come true. Just all these individual human beings putting themselves out there, so. But what is, what is the motor? What can I do for you? What do you want to do with me? I think those are my three of my big questions. Well, I think going back into uh, something that I do say to everybody uh, before we start is, what's your intention? Mm -hmm. What did you intend to happen? Here, when you when you initially wrote it, what's your intention? Because as long as we follow that line, we have a through line to take us through the whole. Same thing you ask thing. actors. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What do you want? Yeah, yeah. Don't you think that if you or somebody who is less qualified than you are reads a play or sees a show and doesn't see the intention, why would they ask the question? Just because yes. I'd run to make sure that it's the playwright's intention and not my own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, understanding in terms of methodology of working in a group. But if the playwright doesn't express the intention in whatever it's written, it becomes futile to ask what's your intention, I think. It's a different side of the coin. It should become transparent, or at least, how should I say, you can surmise it. I, I, asked, I have asked this question in the past, and. I don't know if anyone came with an answer. It, it's about my kind of job, you know. Did Chekhov need a dramaturg to write his plays? But he didn't write them like that overnight. He had people who were commenting, advising, bitching, whatever they were doing. They were his dramaturgs, but there is no need for dramaturgs. This is an American invention. Well. He also, well, a he also was not happy with a lot of his productions because he thought the intention that yes, he wrote it with right. was not being followed. So I think he was his drama. Too. Sanislaski yes. saw what he saw. So yeah, wait, hold on one second. Uh, can we just get a microphone? Yeah. Okay. I just want to just say that I think there's a difference between imposition and intention and that um, I have felt very alienated when I've talked to a director that I felt has imposed a meaning on the play that I think that any literate person should not read into. And so in that process, I feel as if there's a gulf between director and playwright and that affects the system of trust between the two people. So. Um, going back to what you said about partnership, then this partnership is on a faulty premise. Because I feel as if, yes, the play is ready, my intention should be clear, and yet here's this person who's going to impose a meaning that I think doesn't show that they're truly 
paying attention to the text within itself. Great, thank you. We have time for just one more question. Um, so over here. I had a reading here, an early stages reading here, um, about 12 months ago of my play. And what was interesting about that, but very, I don't know what a good word is for paralyzing uh, for me as a playwright, was that the audience felt so very strongly. And they were at polar opposites um, because it was set in Vietnam. It was set during the time of the civil rights. So um, people in the audience felt very strongly, why are you using the word nigger? Uh, other people saying, it's a new age. Um, uh, other people were saying, use the word nigger. It's, 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 uh, it would have been used at that time appropriate to the setting. So it was, and people were like going back and forth. I mean, they felt so strongly that, I mean, I just didn't know where to go as a writer. And I thought I was in a good place, but after that, I, I just yeah. was like, well, how do I rewrite this now? Because people were super passionate about the play and they were like, no, and people were emailing me afterwards saying, don't change it. I heard what this audience member said, but don't change it. It was right. I heard a guy who was, he said, I was in Vietnam, and it's fine just the way it is. So then as a writer, I mean, all that did for me was I was paralyzed, and I still haven't even, like, rewritten yeah. it and put in all their suggestions. Mm -hmm. so, that's part of it. so that's what my question is to you all. I mean, it's good to have audience feedback and participate, but wow, I, I don't know. So you're kind of you're uh, I think expressing a, a situation where it wasn't helpful for you that you were getting too many conflicting comments, too strong, too, with strong I opinions. Saw, I saw two polar yeah. sides. Mm -hmm. Like I saw two polar. You animated the anxiety that was already yeah two in polar <laughs> frames of reference about the play and two polar views of where the play should go. And I was just like, wow, okay. Yeah. Oh yes, Christine would like to respond to that. I'd like to respond to, to that a, a little laterally perhaps and coming back to this next question too, which I think the elephant in the room is the P word, which is production, mm -hmm. you know, in a way. Uh, thinking about your question about Chekhov and the dramaturg, um, I mean, Chekhov had the scaffolding to build his work of actors and a director and productions, you know. I mean, Mark Twain says, a man who picks up a cat by the tail learns something he can learn no other way. You know, there's something about producing a play and working with people to make something in the world that I, I think I think one of the difficult things that we dance around in talking about how to have dialogues with playwrights and about development is the sort of the absence of enough productions in, yes. in you know that, that we are oversupplied with playwrights relative to um, to the established production opportunities. So we need to rethink how that happens in the field. We need to think about how playwrights can be in a room to make their work happen with other people, whether or not it's through the submitting and waiting channel. I mean, the word is playwright. It's right, like a shipwright or a, a, a wheelwright. There's something about this idea of the architect. You know, the architect has a vision, okay, and you can sit around and talk about a picture of a building and the design of the building and the vision of the building forever. But unless the thing stands up in space and time, you haven't finished your job as an architect. And that's when builders come in. And when you learn about things like how a building sits in a park and what it's like for human beings to walk through it. So there's an element of learning to be a playwright that you cannot do just by sitting and having hypothetical conversations about what the play might be like when it became a production. You know, so I don't... I'm just saying that I, I think we should be clear-eyed about the fact that some of these conversations become shell games, you know, mm -hmm. and in the middle is this thing. To be a playwright, you have to put your work on its feet with collaborators and see if it stands up or falls down. That's it. Some of those collaborators are audience members, some of them are the artists that you work with to do it. You know? I think that was a terrific synthesis of many different ideas that were discussed in the panel. The perfect note, actually, to leave our discussion today. Um, I think that this is a great conversation, and I look forward to us continuing this conversation with these panelists, with you in the audience, and as we move forward in the field. And I just want to thank these terrific panelists again for their conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.